the president was no longer simply the president of the United States, but president of the but leader of the free world. Right. That's a formulation that would have been unheard of for previous for previous presidents, even presidents like Woodrow Wilson, who were globally inclined. They never saw themselves as being head of the you know, head, head of head of the free world. So this it almost gave the president an international constituency. Uh, and and this clearly led to an increase of, uh, of of presidential power. Hi, this is Tony Williams, senior fellow at BRI, and we want to welcome you to another episode of the Cold War and the Presidency series. And uh, for this episode, we're honored to have John Moser uh, to speak about Truman and the Cold War. In this series, our main question is really going to be on on how individual presidents shaped executive powers during the Cold War. By way of introduction, John Moser is a professor of history at Ashland University and chair of both the Department of History and Political Science and the Ashbrook Center's Master of Arts in American History and Government. He is an expert on World War II and American foreign policy and is the author of four books, including The Global Great Depression, and the coming of World War II. John, I want to thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Tony. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's such an important topic. We, we just spoke to, to Sean McMeekin uh, about FDR, uh, Stalin, and, and the origins of the Cold War uh, during World War II and some of the tensions in the alliance. And, and this is just going to be a great segue right into, uh, you know, the start of the Cold War and of the Truman administration. Uh, so, so maybe we'll just jump right in. Uh, after fighting as allies during World War II, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union emerged from the war as the world's two superpowers, uh, and, and they were increasingly enemies. American policymakers were really concerned about Soviet expansionism, including Soviet diplomat and expert George Kennan, who helped formulate a policy called containment in his long telegram and the Mr. X article. So John, what, what was containment and, and how does it really shape American foreign policy throughout most of the Cold War? Containment was an extremely, it, you can't even really call it a, a strategy. It's sort of a framework under which multiple strategies could operate. One of my favorite books on the Cold War is by John Lewis Gaddis called Strategies of Containment. It talks about how various presidents uh, they all adhered to containment in some way, but they applied it in, in a very different form. But, but as Kennan advanced the idea in his famous long telegram in 1946, was that if uh, the Soviets are going to look for any opportunity that they can, uh, that, that, that they can find to, uh, to advance their power, and they're going to try pushing, 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 and if the United States, as the leader of the free world, shows itself willing to block those advances uh, again and again, right? He said in an article in 1947, he called for, 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 for calm, patient, firm, patient containment. So you, you, every time they push, you say, no, you don't do it. That eventually the Soviets would, would learn that they're not getting anywhere through this strategy and they would they would either moderate the strategy or maybe even the whole regime would fall. Uh, so that, and, and, and when that was supposed to happen, who knows? I mean, Kennan would later say that he only meant for the term containment, the, the containment to apply to Stalin. And that once Stalin was gone, there was never, there wasn't any really real need to continue it. But by then containment had sort of taken on a life of its own. And every president, as I said before, practiced it. Right, very good. Well, let's look specifically at maybe Truman's uh, formulation and understanding of it. Uh, in 1947, he delivers this important speech advocating aid to Greece and Turkey to resist communism. And he says, I quote, uh, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures, end quote. So what was the Truman Doctrine, and does it provide sort of an expansive view of American foreign policy, of sort of expanded commitments around the globe for the United States? Yeah, when I, when I teach this to students, sometimes they, they miss how important this really is. They're, well, isn't that what America has always done? 
I like to illustrate, uh, to use this example to illustrate the sea change that occurred in U.S. foreign policy over the course of the 1940s. In 1940, Germany was able to overrun much of Europe, including France. And while Americans were dismayed by this, nobody ever said, well, we got to send troops to stop them. Right? Ten years later, ten years, that's nothing. Ten years later, North Korean forces invade South Korea, a place where most Americans probably would have, would have had a hard time identifying on a map. North Korea invades South Korea, and U.S. troops go and fight. And, and that has the overwhelming support of Americans. And part of it, of course, is part of the change is the result of uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor and, and World War II. But the Truman Doctrine is another big part of it. The idea that the United States was now going to take responsibility right, for stepping up behind, uh, uh, to support free peoples all over the world, that was a huge commitment. Uh, among those who, who really were kind of taken aback by it was George Kennan. Kennan said, wait, wait a minute, this is not really what I had in mind. This is, this is going to be a huge open-ended commitment to every, every country that feels, that feels threatened. Um, but, but Truman believed that, you know, Kennan was kind of an old school real politique, right? Kind of a kind of guy there, there are parts of the world that are, that are really within, that are really critical to American interests and therefore have to be defended. Others, not so much. Truman said the American people don't think like that. They think in terms of right versus right versus wrong. We're going to stand up for freedom. And by qualifying it by saying, well, we're going to stand up for freedom in places that are vital to American interests, but other places we're going to you know, not worry about, that's not going to fly with the American people. So Truman chooses this very expansive uh, way of putting it. I mean, the speech itself was aimed at Greece and Turkey, which just about everybody agreed. Those are really, really important. Um, he, you know, he certainly did not have in mind, uh, or, 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 well, Kennan certainly would have been okay with upholding Greece and Turkey, but but other places in the world, not so much. Right, great. Uh, and, and digging around maybe in some lesser known uh, things here with the start of the Cold War, the National Security Act of 1947 and also the National Security Council document NSC 68 they seem to have a very significant impact upon the executive branch and, and the creation of this national security state, this military buildup. What were they? Uh, and how do they change American military capabilities during the Cold War? Yeah, um, NSC, sorry, the, the, sorry, the National Security a, a, a Act um, was, was really aimed at streamlining the armed forces. You had, of course, the Army and the Navy, and they had been traditionally separate cabinet, cabinet level posts, secretary of each. Uh, and then you also had the Army had its own Air Force and the Navy had its own, uh, had its own Air Force, but there had been a, a push throughout the war for the creation of a separate independent Air Force. So you have these three different, uh, three different branches. And it, if you know anything about military history is separate branches are always fighting. Uh, fighting over resources. And the thought was, well, let's unify it under the Secretary of Defense and we're going to reduce that. And I suppose it reduced it. it. It just really, it moved the scene of the fighting from the cabinet where the, where the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of the Navy would go at it to uh, undersecretaries, where the, that's where the fighting would took, take place under the leadership of a single Secretary of Defense. Uh, and, and, and the first secretary of defense was a guy named James Forrestal. The weird thing was Forrestal had been a prominent opponent of the idea of, of uniting this. He said, this is, this, this task is too big for any single member of, uh, every, any single individual. And, uh, sure enough, after a few years in the position, he, uh, he had to step down. He basically suffered a nervous collapse and, and tragically he committed suicide. Not, not, not long afterward. So part of it was to, in the, in an effort to streamline the armed forces and create a single military establishment, you create this department of defense that encompasses all the armed forces. Um, Another aspect of it was the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency. Again, it's a matter of streamlining. Uh, there was Army intelligence, there was naval intelligence, and then there was the 
Office of Strategic Services, which was created during World War II, which conducted all sorts of dirty tricks uh, uh, against the uh, against the the the, the Axis powers uh, during the war. Uh, and the idea was we're going to unite these in one single body. Truman was a little bit leery of this. He he was afraid that it was going to be a to, to use his word a Gestapo. Um, so that so that's the second aspect. The third aspect of the National Security Act is the uh, uh, was the creation of the National Security Council, which was uh, there was a there, there was a national security advisor, and then the council also would include the president and the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and and and, and a couple of others, and, uh, and 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 it was to serve as kind of an advisory body to the president, and. Uh, NSC 68 was hardly the first thing it produced, but it was the first really important document. Uh, the National Security Act was passed in 1947. NSC 68 uh, was, was sent to Truman in early April 1950. And it was written in large part in response to the uh, development of, uh, of atomic capabilities by the Soviet Union. The Soviets had tested their first uh, nuclear weapon in, in 1949. And NSC 68 really portrayed the Cold War as a really an apocalyptic showdown of tyranny versus freedom. Uh, Kennan, when when he saw this, said, "No, this is this is exactly what I've been trying to avoid for years. That's not what what containment's about." Um, and, and but uh, the author, the main author, was a guy named Paul Nitza, who was head of the State Department's policy planning staff. And Nitza's idea was, "Look, if we want to convince Truman, and Truman was the audience for this, we're gonna we're gonna keep." We're going to keep it kind of simple. Not, not that Truman was an ignorant or stupid man by any means, but, but, but he, you know, he he wasn't particularly subtle when it came to international affairs. Uh, so we're going to portray this as a as a monumental global struggle of good versus evil, in which at the moment the United States and the free world are really outgunned. Uh, the, in terms of conventional weapons, the Soviets dwarfed the firepower of, of, of the West, and now the Soviets have the, you know, have the atomic bomb. What do we have to do now? Well, we have to increase the, the, considerably our spending on the military. Interestingly, NSC 68 did not specify any amounts. It just said there's going to be a big buildup. And when Truman got it, he thought, well, you know, I, I kind of agree with this assessment on the other hand. I, I, I've got lots of domestic spending priorities. I don't want to raise taxes because that'll be unpopular. I, I don't know if I if we really want to do this. So he so he he in, in traditional presidential form, he set up a committee and said, study this and come up with some estimates as to a is this worth doing? B how much is it going to cost? And the committee was doing and the committee was supposed to get its its uh, uh, its, its its estimates to Truman by I think July first, nineteen fifty. Well, before that happened, June 25th, North Korean forces invaded South Korea. And for Truman, this was evident, okay, the communist world, up until now, it, it's been kind of a political, the Cold War's been kind of a political battle. But now communism has shown that it's going to take aggressive military action. Uh, Truman was much more inclined to support the conclusions of NSC 68 after the start of the Korean War. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. Uh, and, and that's a great segue for uh, my next question, which is about the Korean War. Um, Truman, very interestingly, receives authorization to go to war from, from the United Nations, right? That there's no congressional declaration of war. How does this pres presidential unilateralism provide a precedent for successors to fight those major wars with, without the declaration of war, which obviously the last one was 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 World War II? Yeah, yeah, it... it, it, it. <laughs> I don't know that Truman even put a whole lot of thought into whether to ask for a declaration of war. The, 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 the arguments for, for why he chose not to do it are really not terribly lofty. I mean, on the one of them kind of was, the other was really based on partisan politics. The, the, the loftier idea was, if you go to war, the American people expect certain things out of a war, right? It's all out. You do everything you can to destroy the uh, destroy the enemy. And he knew that he wanted this to be a limited war. He wanted to 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 drive the North Koreans out of South Korea, uh, 
but he did not want an expansion of the war. He didn't want the Soviets or, or the Red Chinese to get involved. And if you call it a war, then it's going to be it's it's going to make it harder to sell the idea that this is a limited conflict. Then there was the partisan one. He was dealing with a, a very partisan Republican Party that didn't have a majority, but it was very strong at the, at, 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 at the time. And the Republicans wanted to blame the administration for the start of the war. And what they seized upon was a speech that had been given earlier in 1950 by Under Secretary of State Dean Acheson. Acheson was talking about how it was U.S. policy to have a security perimeter in the Pacific. And he said, it's going to include Japan and the Philippines and the Aleutian Islands. Uh, and, and he did not include South, include South Korea in this. And when just a few months later, North Korea invaded South Korea, Republicans said Atchison basically gave them the green light to invade. Now, it's 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 not true. Um, we know now, since the opening of the Soviet archives, what really drove the decision. And, and no, they were not paying attention to Atchison's speech by any by any means. But. Truman was concerned that if he went to Congress to request a declaration of war, he wasn't afraid that the Republicans would say no. That would look unpatriotic. And the American people were in support of, 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 uh, of, of the commitment of forces. He was afraid that Republicans were going to use the opportunity to embarrass the administration and say, see, we wouldn't have had to do that if it hadn't, if it hadn't been for this. So he said, look, we're, we're, this, is, we're not, this is going to be a war uh, in a press conference discussing this. Um, a reporter said, so would you call it a police action? And, and Truman said, yeah, that's basically it. And, and, and that's the term that stuck. Truman didn't come up with it. It was this, this, this reporter said, well, police action. Yeah, 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 police action. So uh, that is, but it has definitely made it, uh, made it easier for subsequent presidents to, uh, to dispense with a formal congressional declaration. Yeah. All right. Well, my last question. So how does Truman's expansive view of American foreign policy and global responsibilities during the Cold War that we've talked about and, you know, unilateralism during the Korean War, how does that all shape executive power in, in your view? Uh, and, and especially not only for his administration, but then for his successors during the Cold War? Yeah, well, it's it's it became common under uh under Truman, even to a certain extent under under roosevelt um to say that the president the president was no longer simply the president of the united states but president of the but leader of the free world right that's a formulation that would have been unheard of for previous for previous presidents even presidents like woodrow wilson who were globally inclined they never saw themselves as being head of the you know head, head of head of the free world so this it almost gave the president an international constituency uh and and this clearly led to an increase of uh, of, of presidential power of course the military establishment would uh, would would continue to grow. Presidents would continue to act without without congressional authorization. Congress in seventy three would try to claw back some of that power in the in 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 the War Powers Act. But you know, over the long haul, I don't know that the War Powers Act has amounted to is amounted to much at all. Uh, so so definitely the, the the globalization of 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 U.S. interests, the threat of the Cold War, the notion that there was a free world, and 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 honestly, if if the United States wasn't going to be the leader of the free world, who was? Uh, that 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 really makes the the debate more more contemporary. So some said as soon as the Cold War was over, okay, the United States can go back just to being a to, to minding its own business, but others said, "Well, well, wait a minute. If you look at periods when there has not been some some dominant hegemonic power, you see a whole lot of instability. So even though the Cold War is over, the United States still should play some kind of role like that. And generally, uh, generally, it has. Uh, and presidents have maintained the kind of power that that that, that Truman claimed, Truman and his successors claimed for the presidency. All right." John, I, I wish we had a few hours to talk about this, uh, but but we appreciate your time and and thank you very much for coming on. It was that was very interesting. Glad to be here. I enjoyed it. Great. Uh, well, thank you for joining us for this mini curriculum video series on the Cold War and the presidency. Check out our other videos on FDR, Kennedy, 
Nixon and Kissinger, and also Reagan with interviews with several leading historians on this very important topic. Thank you for joining us.